Hello and welcome back to our Million Part Gospel series. Last time we talked about the first temptation of Jesus. Got into some detail about that. I figured it would just be a little bit too long of a video to give them all within the same. So we broke it down and this one is going to have the final two temptations uh, of Jesus that, that Satan posed. So we start off the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the pinnacle would have been on the southeast uh, corner where the temple wall was actually built into the, the main wall uh, of the place. You could stand on it, huge fall onto all these stones. So if you had fallen, you, you would definitely die. A brief synopsis of the events is... Uh, Satan says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. It is written that the angels will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus comes back and says that you should not uh, put the Lord to a test. Now, there's a bunch of scripture there that we'll dive into. Like I said, we, we usually just give a, the briefest synopsis of a small segment of text and then get into the details of it. And what I'm learning by doing these videos is that almost every line of the Bible you could write a book about. And honestly, if you, if you really broke it down and looked at the detail in it. So to make a 15, 20 minute video, it's almost, almost not enough for a lot of these things. So I, I just find that so interesting how rich this text actually is. So before we get into the actual scripture text, it's important to understand that once again, Satan isn't on this quest to prove or disprove that Jesus is the Son of God. It has nothing to do with that. So the fact that he's even asking this question over and over again, if you are the Son of God, you do this or that, uh, it kind of it shows that he, he knows wh what Jesus is. He's not just asking every single person. He's not going through a town and going, if you are, if you are. It has nothing to do with that. He's asking these questions because he's well aware that this is the Son of God. Something to consider is that, like Jesus, all of the followers are also targets uh, for Satan in these situations. When you are not on that side, when you're not worshiping Satan by obeying him, by obeying your lusts, and you're obeying God, that gives Satan less power. So now let's get into what Satan is actually talking about, which text when he says it's written. So that is uh, Psalm 91, verse 11, and it goes like this. For he will <clears throat> command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So what this is saying is that Jesus couldn't die in some kind of accident. He couldn't have a, an ox cart uh, slip up or fall down the stairs, uh, th those kind of things. Jesus is here so he could live a sinless life and die as a sacrifice on a certain Passover. So God is going to make sure that he gets to that point. The part that Satan omits in this whole thing is the part that says, remember because he loves me. We, we keep saying and love is a, an active verb in the Bible. You can't just say you love something, you obey it. If you think about a marriage, you can, let's say somebody's cheating on their wife all the time and doing whatever and spending money frivolously, and they say, but I love you, baby, I love you. It's it's actually not enough, and, it, and that's not love. Uh, there's uh, an obedience and activity that it requires to love, and, that, and that's what they're talking about here. So if Jesus didn't obey and trust God, if he was just putting him to this test, God would be under no obligation to protect Jesus in this situation. And when you look at what Satan is doing in here, this is exactly what false teachers do all the time. They take a little bite 
a little bit of, uh, of scripture and they twist it and they leave out words and they cherry pick in all sorts of ways. And Satan is the original, the OG fake preacher. And when you see all of these people in your, your news feed about uh, how Jesus is actually pro-trans and, and all, all these things, this is exactly what, what you see from Satan here. So keep, keep on a lookout. This brings up a major point that Christians always have an issue with. Uh, and that is turning God, turning Jesus into a genie. If you do this for me, I will be the best Christian ever. Uh, any kind of thing like that, and it, and it completely puts you on the same same plane as God, uh, as if you can barter with him, if he needs something from you. And it's so anti-scripture uh, that it, it should be probably called blasphemy to, to even do this process of turning God into a genie. And uh, I, I speak from some experience with this because I am more guilty of that than, than most. Um, when I was 15, 16 years old, I grew up in an interfaith family. So my mother was Catholic and my father was Jewish. So my father was more of an agnostic and my, my mother was Catholic in the sense that she went to Catholic school, but didn't exactly uh, re pour through scripture all the time and um you know recite recite it to me and explain it to me so it was pretty much in the dark about a lot of this stuff and i hadn't even read uh, most of the bible at this point so i was just grasping for straws but somewhere around 15 or 16 i felt a real presence from god and it inspired me to at least call myself christian and i remember i carved out this uh this cross out of wood I whittled it i did some woodworking at that point and I loved it. And I carved all sorts of things, like personal things into it. And some kind of blood magic thing. I cut myself in part of the, uh, part of the process. And uh, the blood, I kind of painted it with the blood. Because it's not sick and embarrassing. And, uh, you know, all this. So fast forward, I'm getting my road test. And all stupid things. And previous to this, I would be like, oh, God, if you just make me pass this math test, I'm going to, I'll be the best. And, and all these completely disgusting things. Um, and I was getting a road test. And to get your license, you, you take it around 16 in New York. And somebody who was, I thought, one of my closest friends, he, he was actually really not, uh, text me, and I was taking the road test at the same time that we were going to school. Uh, so every, the class was stuck out, and I just wasn't there. I was taking the road test. And he texts me, like, oh, we're all laughing because, like, we think that you're going to fail, and, like, we're taking bets on it. Good for it. And sure enough, I failed. I failed really quick. I, I, I was inching up. The guy thought I was going, and he breaks. Once they break on their little handbrake on their side, you're done for. So um, I went home, and I was just devastated. And I took this cross that I worked so hard on and felt so many good things, and I threw it across uh, the property lines. Two properties over. I usually can't throw out anything at all, but I was ma I managed to be able to throw this a tremendous distance. And from that point on, I did not feel that presence of God for 20 years. 20 years of going down every wrong road that I could possibly take. Um, when I first started to feel this presence again and decided to go through the Gospels and start reading them, and, and get involved, I started to make a new cross. I whittled it out and I carved them when I finished it. And I've been going to church and, and studying. And for the last four years, I've been trying to have a child. And something about knowing what happened with bargains in the past, I made a conscious effort to keep telling myself, hey, if it is just this feeling, just this feeling, just this feeling of the presence of God, that's all I need. And if he doesn't do anything for me ever again in my life, that's going to be enough. That's worth it, just to have this feeling. And within a month, my wife became pregnant. 
And it was just truly, truly one of those moments where you just say, God is good. God is great. And I will never make that mistake again in my life. Do not, do not challenge him. He's not a genie. <laughs> you need to, you need to appreciate what you get. And that, that's what this, that's what this is all about. And when Jesus goes and he quotes Deuteronomy again, I said, you should not try to force uh, God to try to prove himself to you. And this is what the Jews did in the desert all the way back then when they grumbled in the state of deprivation. Rather than ask for food, they indicted God for not being able to help. That, that was that was the claim, and like that he couldn't provide them food. He can create the whole universe, but he can't give these people food. He can't make me pass a road test, which was quite a challenge, but I'm sure God could do it uh, if, if he wanted to. And just how insulting and stupid that is, and and how much of a how much of a distance that creates between you and God, it, it one of the worst things that you could possibly do. That's what this prosperity gospel kind of thing is all about. Uh, God owes you this. If you do this, you're gonna do it. If you do this little thing, say something, do something, God will grant your wishes for you, uh, as if He needs to to do this. And this isn't our relationship with God. This is not what Scripture indicates. Most commonly in Scripture, a follower of God is considered a servant, or doulos is even a slave in, in the Greek. So believers of Jesus have been bought and redeemed with the blood of Christ, and we have to silence that really prideful part of us that makes us think that we are on this even standing with, with God. We have no right to anything that God doesn't dictate. When, when Jesus talks to the disciples in Luke 17, verse 7, he says something to this extent of if you had slaves and they came in from the field, would you tell them, hey, don't worry about me, um, you take a breather, you guys deserved it? Uh, there's never this moment that you can say to God, hey, I've done some things for you. Why don't we get a little bit, let's get some quid pro quo back as if he hasn't given you so much, a countless number of positive things in your life on to say, oh, but if you don't do this, we're, we're done. That, that's, that's bargaining. So now that Satan has challenged Jesus with the lusts of the bodies and the pride for life, uh, where he twisted the scripture in different ways, and Jesus responded with true interpretations of the scripture. Satan takes Jesus to the highest mountain and shows him all the kingdoms on the earth. And he says, if you worship me, I will give you all of these things. And Job chapter 1 verse 6, God asks Satan where he's been. And he says, I've been roaming the lands. I've been, I've been here. And, that, and that's where, as Paul even says later on, God, uh, Satan is the god of this world. So he prowls here. This is his domain. When you look at the most evil people in the world, a lot of them are the most powerful. And it's not, not much of a coincidence. So this is the opportunity to get this kingdom that Jesus is promised by God in a way easier way. You don't have to do the... The crucifixion, you don't have to do any of that. You just bow down here and you get it all. But in truth, as scripture says, Satan is not going to have dominion forever. So instead of getting this eternal kingdom, as Jesus promised, he is going to get this very finite kingdom and he is going to eventually lose it and be removed from God's grace forever. So he absolutely does not take the deal. And this is the lust of the eyes. And if you look at all of these temptations, when Jesus finally turns them all down, Satan leaves. Satan has no power other than to do these temptations. But at the end of it, he has to walk away. He can't force anyone to do anything. And, and that's the big lesson here that all your, your brothers and sisters, all the people for thousands of years have faced this temptation, uh, and temptations, and they've turned it down. And all you have to do is push it away, get into your scripture like, like God inspires Jesus to do, 
in all of these and be able to vanquish this demon and, and, and save him. I think it's so important, especially now when there's so much in social media, fake preachers who are pushing one agenda after the next, and they're using scripture. And if you're not really grounded in what your scripture tells you, they can pull a little, little bit out of something. They can cherry pick. They can remove some words like you see Satan do here. And they can shook you and take you completely off course. And you'll think that you're a practicing Christian when you're worshiping something that is far less and far worse. So it's a, a big, big lesson in this one. So those are our temptations. I'm glad we wrapped this one up. Um, like I said, they're, they're very personal to me. I think some people who are born Christian and go through their life as Christian might not have the, the same experience of not having this for decades and what that feels like. And I don't want to say that you appreciate it more, because I think a lot of these people are, are very genuine, but it certainly gives you a little bit of a different perspective on some of these things and the downfalls. I used to um, teach guitar, and I always felt like I was a better guitar teacher because I was horrible at guitar. And I made every single mistake and lost months and months and years of going down the wrong course instead of practicing correctly. So I knew all the mistakes people naturally made. And I think in some ways it, it kind of helps to uh, talk about this God when you have failed and messed up so many times in your life. So on that that positive note, I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. We'll get back into some John the Baptist, our old buddy, uh, see what he's all up to uh, from there. And I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. Like, subscribe, comment, share, and all the other things. Watch them over and over again 30 times. So uh, so my, my stats look really good, all that. Uh, but yeah, th thank you very much and have a great day. Take care.